This is Ethics and I'm Mark Borsby. Um, in this video series, we're surveying a number of ethical problems, looking at how they relate to a, our everyday experience in the world. And I encourage you to follow along. We're using the book Ethics, Essential Readings and Moral Theory. Um, it's edited by George Scher. Uh, but pretty much all these essays are published elsewhere, and so you should be able to find this online pretty much for free um, or at your local library. So hope you, oops, sorry, hope you follow along with us. Um, so today we're going to be taking a look at an essay called Moral Luck by Thomas Nagel. Um, here is a picture of Thomas Nagel. I'll tell us, you can learn more about Thomas Nagel actually by visiting um, the New York um, University Department of Philosophy website. Um, he is a professor emeritus, but he's a very well-established contemporary philosopher. I pulled his CV from his website just to give you a sense of some of the things he's done. Um, he actually... Um, got his PhD from Harvard University uh, between 1960 and 63, the Kennedy years, uh, began as, assistant, as an assistant professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley, um, and then has taught many, many other places, but notably since 1980 at New York University. Um, he's written many books, uh, just to give you a, a, a sort of sample of some of his books here. Um, he's written the po he start his first book is the possibility of altruism from 1970, followed by Mortal Questions in 1979. The discussion of more um, moral luck comes up, and this is actually included in the second set of books. Um, and he's written, written other books, including The View from Nowhere, um, What Does It All Mean? Um, one of the other famous essays he's famous for is What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Who is she? Or, attacks the notion of physicalism. His most recent book here is Mind and Cosmos, a very interesting book, uh, but it did recently spark a bit of controversy because he argues that, well, as you can see from the title, that the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. Um, so we should say there that in this book he does not he doesn't articulate an argument for God's existence. He doesn't think that's He's not, he's not a, he doesn't believe in God's existence, so he's an atheist. Um, but he thinks that the materialist conception of nature we have today is almost certainly false, um, and which sparked huge huge amount of controversy, particularly regarding his critique of Darwinian um, evolutionary uh, evidence. Um, so it was very, it's a very, very interesting book. I encourage you to take a look at it. If you go to Amazon's um, comments, or at least it used to be the case that um, there's a lot of people who would comment on the book in the, in the Amazon store, a lot of passionate critiques. So you can sort of get a sense of the controversies he's sparked. He's a very, very well-known uh, philosopher. And I think one of the best and most important American philosophers of the late 20th century and early 2000s, of course. Um, so we're going to take a look at this problem of moral luck. The other thing I'll mention, too, is that there's another essay by Bernard Williams that... Um, also called Moral Luck, which is sort of in a dialogue here with this essay. So if you want to do more research, look up Moral Luck by Bernard Williams. We looked at Bernard Williams earlier in the in the series of videos here, but take a look. Provocative exchange between these two thinkers. So let's sort of start off here with the problem. And what I want to do in this video is really just sort of track through the major points, points in the argument. So you have a sense of what moral luck here we're just referring to um, and why it's important. So we sort of start with the second of those considerations and that's really this sense of what the problem is. And take a look here, He, uh, Thomas Nagel here um, actually references Kant, but remember here in our video series we've been talking about Kant's moral theory. And Kant's moral theory, remember, was this deontological view of the world, the idea that what's morally wrong or right, good or bad, is ultimately determined through an operation of reason, um, by a uh, practical action by which we articulate, uh, by which we're bound to certain um, laws um, under what he called the universal um, universal moral law. So, and then we talked about the categorical paradigm and so forth. But remember, Kant was a de was a deontologist and not a consequentialist, and that meant that Kant ultimately didn't think that the consequences of our actions, though they're important for obvious practical reasons. Um, but that the consequences of our actions were not morally determinative, meaning that simply because I do something and um, the consequences of those actions create um, some sort of other event, right? It's not the consequence of my action that makes an action wrong or right. It's the action itself. And in particular, it's the comprehensibility and the rational ability 
um, to understand what one is doing and why one is doing it. Uh, so it's about moral duty, and at the core of it is the notion that moral duty is rational. Um, and this is, uh, is very important. You remember we contrasted Kant's moral philosophy here with utilitarianism, which is consequentialist. Um, and so then that was a big discussion so far we've had. So first off, so we're pretty familiar with this, is that moral, moral duty for Kant is a rational operation, and it's non-consequentialist. So for instance, in the discussion of the goodwill, the goodwill is good because of its willing, not because of its accomplishments. And this is, right, the, the very first major argument Kant gives, if you read the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, is that the goodwill is, is intrinsically good, but it's not good because of what it does, but because of what it is. Um, and that's a really important determination here. And second here is that the bad will, so if someone wants to do it's bad, is bad regardless of its accomplishments. So the bad will is bad because of what it is, right? And so the question is, what is the will, right? And what does it mean for a will to be good or bad? At least that's the, the bigger question we've been looking at here. But for Nagel, this means that luck should not play a role in making moral judgments, right? Um, because um, when we, that is when we make moral judgments, particularly about someone else's conduct, which is make, it, make that clear, right? So if someone does something and I make a moral judgment about them, my moral judgment should be based upon the reasonability of things and whether or not the agent was reasonable and intended to do the right thing and so on and so forth. Right, because remember, some actions are not reasonable. Um, that's the sort of implication of the categorical imperative. Um, and so, luck shouldn't play a role, right? And this should just make sense normally, right? Think in your daily life in which you encounter people as doing something wrong or right. And this may not, this is, sort of depends maybe on one station in life to a certain degree. Um, but for instance, as a parent, I have children. And so there is, so I do make moral judgments on my children. So for instance, if what if my daughter hits my son or vice versa, right? And then, you know, there's a discipline, there's a punishment for that. Um, when that happens, I'm making a moral judgment about what they've done, right? Um, and, and luck shouldn't play a role. So for instance, I shouldn't punish my children because they were unlucky, right? Uh, for instance, when I was a kid, my dad did this. Um, I invited a friend over to my house and we had a huge bay window <laughs> And my friend threw a basketball through our window and it cost my parents hundreds of dollars to fix. Um, and they were very upset, but my father punished me. He actually gave me a spanking. And to this day, whenever, I mean, now we're over it, it doesn't matter anymore, right? But at the time, and I still think it was an unjust punishment and he agrees with me actually. Um, why is it unjust? Because it's bad luck. How can I control what my friend does when he throws the basketball through the window? Um, so, Think of this, luck shouldn't play a role when we're making moral judgments. So what's the problem? Here's a couple key points from the essay and from his discussion. Okay, A, people should only be held for what they're responsible for, okay? Two, or B, things outside of our control are not in the domain of moral responsibility. And this seems like a reasonable uh, premise as well, because um, if you can't control something, how can you be made responsible for it? Remember, we've talked about this previously, that Wherever you have a responsibility, uh, I'm sorry, whenever you have a right, there's a duty that follows. So there always has to be a coordinating duty. Um, so you can see here uh, that when we make a moral judgment about what someone can do, it has to be possible for them to do something else, um, as it were. Um, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So there's a sort of binary opposition here that's at the core of things, which is the things that are outside of control are not in the domain of our responsibility. C, making a moral judgment is a judgment on the person, not on the situation, right? We have to remember there are some situations that are bad, but just because people are living through them doesn't mean that, that we, that doesn't entail a moral judgment about that person's actions as doing what's wrong or right. Here, think about, for instance, um, an emergency worker who's in a building trying to save someone from a fire. He makes a decision. It's the wrong decision. Right, and someone dies. Of course, the, the everyone will be upset about it, but we wouldn't make a moral judgment about what uh, thing the um, fireman did, most likely. Not unless there's obvious negligence or something, 
right? But the idea that just because things there's a bad situation doesn't entail that we would make a bad a moral judgment of someone being a bad person or doing the wrong thing morally, right? So D, these sorts of moral judgments only take really what it looks like as one type of object, right? Um, that is, moral judgments take an object, it has to be the will of the person at the end of the day in the content terms, but in our ordinary life, right, it looks like our moral judgments only take a type of object, that is, we can only make moral judgments about things which have a choice about their actions, right? So people have to be free in order to, to make a, a, people have to be free to do the wrong thing for us to make a moral judgment about that person. That doesn't mean we don't make judgments about what people do, right? So for instance, a flight controller makes a bad decision, right? And it results in the loss of the aircraft. Uh, the decision, right, would be, a that would have been, we can make a judgment about what the person did, but not make a, a moral judgment about that person. Now, E is there's also what, in all these cases seem to reveal, is that there's always has to be a clear absence of control that's produced by involuntary movement, physical force, or ignorance, which excuses us, um, which excuses what is done from a moral judgment, okay? So a clear absence of control that's produced by some sort of involuntary force or movement or ignorance is what excuses um, what is done from being <clears throat> made subject to a moral judgment. So that means that when there's control and someone has control of what's doing, we can make moral judgment, and when they don't, we can't. So, but here's the question. What do, what about, um, what, but what we do does depend upon the invol these involuntary features. And so this is a big, yeah, a big but here, a big conjunction that he throws in his premises in the discussion here is what we do does depend upon these involuntary forces. So in order for me to act in any way, both including, you know, just turning on my car, it does, these involuntary features of the world are actually absolutely necessary features, right? It's frequent example made that you can't control gravity. You can't levitate, for instance, right? Uh, well, think about it. So we don't hold you responsible morally for, um, you know, we don't make a moral judgment about you staying, walking on earth because you have a choice not to. You don't have any choice otherwise. But notice that all of your other choices do depend upon the notion of gravity. So what we have here is what looks like to be a sort of network of um, involuntary forces and mechanisms that exist in the world, not to mention all of the ignorances that I have about that world that seem to be really integrated into the things that we actually do do and the choices that we actually do make. So on the one hand, control is absolutely necessary for making moral judgments. And we say that when there is not control, then we won't make the moral judgment. But you can see here is that even when we are making judgments in which we have control, there's a whole bunch of things that are out of our control that are also related. So there seems to be something of a puzzle here. And so he mentions three examples sort of in the beginning here, right? He doesn't follow them through in too much detail, but we'll see, really he follows through the manslaughter case, we'll see. But he gives the example of, for instance, a rescuer a person a rescuing, for one example is rescuing a person from a burning building and then actually dropping that person 12 stories while trying to save them. So imagine there's a terrible accident, right? On the one hand, of course, in this case, uh, we wouldn't make a moral judgment about the rescuer, right? Obviously, it's a bummer. Um, that's probably understating it, right? It's terrible. And we'll expect, and we wouldn't be surprised if the rescuer um, feels a lot of bad feelings and they feel a lot of regret about that. We'll see that Nagel thinks that's actually an important feature of, um, of thinking about this problem of moral luck. It's also related to, um, to the essay by Bernard Williams as well in particular. Another example here is the difference between a reckless, someone who's recklessly driving and manslaughter. So um, here's a sort of example. This isn't exactly what Nagel spells out, but when I here's the example I always give. Imagine, for instance, you are um, driving your car and you get up to the light and it turns ye yellow, but you decide to run through it. And then right before you get to the light, um, the light turns red 
and then you speed through, right? So think about there, imagine that you run through this light, which probably all of us who drive have done this. Um, and then imagine there's a police officer there, right? And then you get a ticket, right? A police officer stops you and asks you, why did you run the red light? And, you know, you explain why you did it. And he says, okay, well, there's a punishment for that. Now that would seem a morally just punishment, right? The person who is running through lights should get a punishment because what they've done is wrong in itself, right? And from a Kantian perspective, for instance, by violating the law, etc. So it's reckless driving. And we would expect a punishment in that case. But now imagine the very same case, but with a slightly different scenario. You're, again, driving through. Uh, it's the exact same scenario. You're coming up to the light. It turns yellow. You decide to gun it. It turns red right before you get there. You run through the light. You've done the exact same thing. Except this time, in this case, right as you're about to, you know, crossing the intersection, a, a small child steps out in front of the car. And unfortunately, you hit her uh, with the vehicle and she's killed instantly. Um, and then, of course, the policeman's there and the policeman stops you. Well, in this case, the policeman is not going to charge you with reckless driving and give you a $100 ticket or whatever the cost is, right? In this case, the policeman is probably likely to arrest you and take you to jail for committing manslaughter, right? And then you may easily go to prison um, over that charge. And so think about it here. On the one hand, um, I just realized manslaughter is misspelled. My apologies. Um, but so on the one hand, you can see we make a moral judgment. Both cases, the moral judgment appears to be a correct moral judgment. They did commit manslaughter. They did. They were reckless driving. They were driving recklessly. So in both cases, we, have, we can make a moral judgment, but you can see they're very different moral judgments. But when we ask the question of what was, what was the intention of uh, the driver, in both cases, the intention is the same. So the question is, why do we treat one case is, why don't we make a moral judgment against one person harsher in case A as opposed to case B, right? Why, why the severity of the moral judgment here? Um, when it looks like, the, case, the in this case, whether or not there's a person to strike in the road appears to be simply a matter of luck. In this case, bad luck, right? So this is the problem of moral luck. And when you think through it, it does seem quite problematic. How, and this is why I love this essay. It's one of my favorite essays in ethical theory, contemporary ethical theory. Because in one, on the one hand, it's quite clear that we that there's something worse in one case as opposed to the other, namely that the child was killed. But it doesn't appear that the driver had any control over that condition. And so because of that, it seems like it doesn't seem to be just punishment. Right? It doesn't seem to be the case that we're treating people fairly based upon their intention and their will. Another example he says is, for instance, a person who becomes a Nazi in Nazi Germany in the 1930s will make a moral judgment about what they did as being wrong. But what about, for instance, the person who lives in Argentina who, in the 1930s who'd be willing to become a Nazi, but simply because the Nazi party didn't come to power or there, right? This person does not become a moral Nazi. And we make a different moral judgment upon them. In this case, you have the exact same will, but a different of circumstance in which we judge one person as being morally repugnant versus not the other. Um, so you can see here, it looks like our circumstances play a big role in terms of our moral judgments, actually. And it's not simply a matter of rationality. Oh, oops, I forgot one thing here, right? Um, in other words, what a person does depends upon the things that are actually also and particularly outside of their control. So it's even worse than that. Um, we need things outside of our control, as it were, um, in order to create the net requisite pre, pre, uh, the requisite preconditions for us to act morally. Um, right. So here's a quote from Nagel. And these page numbers are from the anthology, not mortal luck. I realize I should have used mortal luck for this. Uh, but anyhow... If the condition of control is consistently applied, it threatens to erode most of the moral assessments we find um, it naturally to make. The things for which people are morally judged are determined in more ways than we at first realized by what is beyond their control. And when the seemingly natural requirement of fault or responsibility is applied in light of these facts, it leaves few pre-reflective judgments intact. Ultimately, nothing or almost not uh, nothing about what a person does seems to be under his control. 
Um, so think about that for a moment. So we make these moral judgments about people. And at the end of the day, the more and more we look at it, the less and less it appears that they're actually in control of what they're doing. Um, and it's not just because, I shouldn't say like that. It's not that they're just, it looks like they're not, they're out of control of what they're doing, but it looks like the control itself has the prerequisite of things which are not controlled. Um, so it, it means that there's like a structural problem in the very nature of the way we think about our actions. And think about this on the everyday level. We're constantly making moral judgments about how we ought to act. Should I open the door for this person or if they think that's rude? Uh, maybe that's just more of a custom thing, right? Should I um, tell the person, should I tell a friend what someone else told me about them that they would not want to hear? Should I tell them yes or no, right? Think of these moral things. Think of if you're a boss, should I, who should I fire, right? Who, if someone has consistently broken the rules, uh, should, what should the punishments be, and so on and so forth. In this average everyday world we live in, we're constantly making these moral judgments. And it looks like that they all are predicated on control, but control itself requires this precondition of this litany of circumstantial things that are just simply out of our control. So this is, on the one hand, not just a theoretical problem. He actually says it's not a theoretical problem, but a philosophical one. And this is very interesting because here we have a distinction between theory versus philosophy. And I don't think, well, he doesn't, as far as I could tell in the reading here, in reading his work uh, from this essay, that I don't think he really clarifies the difference between here. The way I'm taking it is when he says that it's not a theoretical problem, it's not just that this is a problem for Kant's deontological theory. And it's not just a problem, right, for... Um, you know, how we should understand Kant's conception of the will, right? Um, but it's a philosophical one in that it goes to the very core of the nature of what we think about all of these things. So I think there's a sort of, that's a sort of cue that this is a radical problem. And it's not just applicable to Kant, but it's applicable across, across a wide array of spectrum. And in fact, he'll even specifically link this problem of control as being an analog to the problem of whether or not we can have knowledge in the world, and whether or not we should be skeptics. So it's sort of interesting parallel here. So I think that's what he means when he says it's not. A, it's a, when he says it's a philosophical problem, not a theoretical problem, right? Control does not seem to be just a generalization about moral life, but it seems correct and actually necessary. Um, and, and that the point there is that it's not that the notion that. It's not that when we say that someone has to be in control of their actions that we make a moral judgment about them. We're not just saying that to generalize uh, some sort of feature of agency, right? No, we're saying that because it seems absolutely necessary that we shouldn't uh, make moral judgments about people when their actions are outside of their control, right? Um, so you see here, this is this is a big deal here. Because uh, on the one hand, it, intuitively, uh, the idea is totally correct. But on the other hand, upon reflection, it seems to break down. So he has this great quote, the, ero the erosion of moral judgment emerges not as an absurd consequence of an oversimple theory, but as a natural consequence of the ordinary idea of moral assessment when it's applied in view of a more complete and precise account of the fact, right? And this is when he links it here. On the one hand, you can see it seems to be a phenomenological problem or a perceptual problem regarding about something to do with the nature of how we recognize moral judgments and how we recognize these facts. And there is a parallel here with epistemological skepticism um, in which you seem to have a, a similar bifurcation. Um, he says, for instance, our beliefs seem to depend upon things that are just as much outside of our control as well. So think about the range of beliefs we hold. Um, and it looks like these range of beliefs uh, are not actually ours. Um, so for instance, think about the traditions we hold. So I, um, um, I celebrate Christmas every year. So Christmas is a part of a tradition, but that tradition precedes me. What, and the truth is, why do I celebrate Christmas every year? A big part of it is because that's what was done when I was a child. I'm repeating what was done before me. And the beliefs I hold, even, even if you don't celebrate Christmas, but you know when we go through these different seasons of giving and things like this, where uh, many of them are commercialized today, but all, these, all cultures, secular and religious, seem to have these sort of beliefs. And it doesn't look like these beliefs 
really depend upon my choosing them. But in many cases, they seem to depend upon things that are outside of my control. Um, so you can see here, this is sort of a big issue. So there, now we have to ask, well, how can we understand luck and what types of luck are there? Um, Nagel says that he thinks that there's really four different ways that we can just, the, the problem of luck or the issue of luck gets distributed in terms of our moral considerations here. And the four different types of luck, if you will, is the first is constitutive luck. Um, and here I have a little bit more of an explanation than the others, because uh, others I think are, are easier and clearer to understand. But constitutive luck is the notion that the kind of person you are depends upon not just the deliberation you give in your actions, but the kind of person you are in terms of your capacities um, and your temperament and these other considerations, right? So that is, some of the luck is, is related to the, your own constitution, right? Um, so for instance, imagine that the way someone might act, for instance, or think about two, pe two persons who had different childhoods, right? Think about a person who grew up on the streets, um, try, you know, having to you know, find food and find money, um, and never actually having a really sort of stable home or environment and lacks education, right? So imagine a person who grows up under those circumstances and imagine the types of beliefs and customs, expectations, and also tendencies and um, forms of deliberation that that person will have. And then compare them to another person who's grown up in a household where uh, they, they, were, they were, had a marvelous education, every, you know, their circumstances in terms of food and shelter, all of those are provided for them. Imagine that sort of person and the sorts of temperament they will have, their capacities, um, and also think about the types of deliberation they're likely to undertake when they look at the very same moral problem, right? So call it the, the bus stop example. Imagine these two people meet at a bus stop and they, they see, for instance, a moral event occur, right? They, let's say they see uh, an old woman get her purse stolen in front of them, right? And then they react in different ways. Uh, the question here is you could see we would expect them to react in different ways because of their a difference in their constitution over time, really, right? And we can say that that means that there's sort of constitutive luck potential, potentially. The second type of luck is circumstantial luck, and that would be the luck of the circumstances in which the moral events themselves take place, right? Um, and that, I think the example here... Um, um, the example here that we were giving of the, uh, the the little girl stepping out in front of your car, this seems to be an example of circumstantial luck, where it looks like the difference between manslaughter there and just being a reckless driver seems to consist in just bad luck, right, Cir by the circumstances. There's also a difference here, three and four types of luck that relate to cause, of, cause and effect or causality. Because remember, when we make an act, that act will have consequences. So when we evaluate those consequences, and remember, it does, this doesn't just have to apply to Kantian deontological moral theory because it's a philosophical problem that applies to moral theory writ large, right? So remember, when there, whenever there's a one action that causes another event, right? Action A is, causes necessarily, I'm sorry, event A causes necessarily event B, right? Uh, this is what we call the antecedent, and this is what we call the consequent in logic, right? So, we would, so he says that the antecedent luck is when the luck of an event leads to an effect that you, right, there's just an unlucky event that occurs that causes a bad effect. Another example here would be you, an action is taken, but there's a lack of consequence in one's action, right? So you have a sort of consequential luck failure, right? And sort of an interesting example here would be to think about the, the United States' government to the crash of 1929. And the United States government didn't do anything because they thought it would create moral hazard, right? They thought that if they stepped in and started, you know, um, issuing funds, I suppose, um, to all the banks and institutions that were going belly up, right? They thought that if they did that, then what would happen is then people would come to expect that, they'd, um, uh, that the government would always do that, and that people would become increasingly more irresponsible. And so the notion was that you should just let the system heal itself. So they did nothing. And that is a type of action, right? But the consequence of that action, well, consequentially, right, they were just wrong about what would happen. And, there, and here you have a sort of lack of the consequences of one's actions, or you take an action and it just doesn't result in the correct effect. Um, and that's outside of your control, potentially.
Um, so you can see here, take a, he goes actually back specifically to the case of accidentally running over a child with your car. And one of the important features, and this is a point that Bernard Williams discusses as well, um, is the problem of agent regret. So um, notice here in that when you when if a person ran over a child, and in this case, imagine that the person who runs over the child was driving safely, right? Imagine that. It's just an accident, for instance. And we wouldn't, in that case, we wouldn't actually hold the person responsible, but we would expect them to have some sort of regret and to feel bad, right, about doing it. Now, of course, if they're driving through the car, if they are driving recklessly and they hit the child, um, then we will recognize a type of negligence, right? And we'll base ultimately their, you know, our moral judgment on it based upon the degree of that negligence, it would seem, right? Um, it, or, or, I'm sorry, I think in this case, he actually gives the example that part, an, ex, an example of agent regret would be, for instance, negligence, right? So imagine in this case, the person, a kid steps out in front of your car, you slam on the brakes, but the brakes don't work effectively as they would have if you had gotten your brakes changed, you know, last week then in this case, you would feel more bad for being negligent as opposed to not having your brakes serviced, right? And think about here the way in which when people are, when people hurt other people on accident, think about the way in which they feel bad and think about the way in which they, uh, we expect them to feel bad. My, this happened to me actually, um, or an example of this happened to me. I was on the Q train in Brooklyn and in, while we were in the middle of the tunnel, suddenly the train came to a screeching halt. Um, and we didn't know what was happening. People actually started panicking because they, because then it came on the intercom. They said, we're going to have to evacuate the train. Um, it said, you're going to have to go through the doors. Every door on the train was locked. So people started getting scared, thinking, what if there's a fire? And people started, it got a little bit, you know, nerve wracking people's reaction, how quickly people lost it, I think. Or, well, I don't know. There was a temptation there. But eventually they let us out of the, they got, the policemen came eventually, opened up all the doors. And then we all filed out. As we were filing out, we realized what was going on. Um, we had to file up and then we were, because half the train was in the station, half of it wasn't. Someone had jumped out in front of the train to commit suicide and was hit and struck by the train and killed. And when we came through the train, I saw in the next car, so not in the car we were walking in, but the door was shut. It was the driver or the um, the conductor and the conductor was weeping. Right? He was very, he was weeping. And then we looked out on the platform and we could see blood. So that's this point when we realized what had happened. Now, in this case, let's think about the example of the conductor. The conductor sitting there weeping. Would we hold the conductor morally responsible for killing that person? No, we wouldn't. In fact, we wouldn't even hold them responsible for manslaughter, right? Um, right? Even though you could say that technically, I guess, they did slaughter another human being. Right. Or they didn't is the problem. I guess the train did. Right. The person killed themselves, we would say. But notice here, what if, for instance, the, the train conductor reacted differently? Right. And we because we right, think we would tell the conductor it's not your fault. Don't feel bad. Right. But what if the conductor, even though it wasn't their fault, what if they didn't feel bad? What if the conductor you looked over and the what if the, the conductor said, was heard joking about it, about the thing saying, oh, good, I get the day off now, right? That, at that point, we would think there's something morally wrong about that person, right? Notice we would start to make a moral judgment about them, right? Uh, which is sort of an interesting feature. So notice that uh, negligence is sort of the interesting case and the question of agent regret, I think is even more interesting, right? But, and for example, here, in going back to the case of the child, but if no child were killed, then the driver would only blame himself slightly, right? <laughs> so imagine that the child wasn't killed, but it only oh, barely stopped, right? The driver would think, um, you know, I should get those brakes changed, but it's not a big deal. Whereas if they killed someone because they didn't change the brakes, they would think it's a really big deal. Okay, so no, keep in mind this notion of agent regret. And ultimately what, where Nagel's driving us is he wants us to recognize that what we seem to be comparing is truly really two different types of two different types of view, two different types of perspective, um, a sort of rational, um, objective, determinist perspective, as opposed to this personal, um, intrinsic perspective that we do make choices. Um, and so he thinks it's a collapse of perspective. But there are other examples of luck, for instance. Think of the American Revolution, Anna Karenia, um, Chamberlain signs the Munich Agreement, right? The Decemberists convinced the troops to revolt against the Tsar. All of these are cases in which 
uh, a lot of what happens ultimately is just just depends upon the features of the world and one can't control them. And it looks like, I think, um, uh, I think the Anna Karenia example is interesting there because he's giving the example, I don't want to go into Anna Karenia really, but he's giving an example from, uh, from Dostoyevsky, who's a famous for giving examples of great moral crisis. And it, implicit in them is always these, the things are actually outside of your control. And it's how you live in that, um, I guess uncertainty that makes all the moral determination, makes all the difference in the moral determination. Um, but yet, if things are outside of control, things are outside of the the agent, the control of the agents. Okay, sorry, I'm having trouble talking this morning or this afternoon. Okay, because all of them are cases where the outcomes cannot be foreseen with certainty. So um, the Decemberists, for instance didn't know that their coup, att their attempt at a coup would fail and then all the troops would be, you know, have, would, would have suffer the consequences. They didn't know that. Chamberlain didn't know that we signed the Munich Agreement that everything would go wrong and the Second World War would happen, right? Um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can see here that there seems to be two types of moral assessment that we're, we're recognizing here is that on the one hand, we're, there's the essential ingredients of the moral assessment, and then there seem to be the other ingredients, the contingencies uh, that are related. So when, we're, when we do make moral assessments, we do assess the contingent with the essential, but these seem to be two distinctly separate tasks, as it were. So why is morality dependent upon control here? Well, Nagel suggests that the problem is, then is why is it irrational to base moral assessment on what people do in this broad sense? It amounts to holding them responsible for the contributions of fate, as well as their own, provided that they've made some contributions to begin with. Okay, so one approach, for instance, to deal with this issue would be just to pare down everything to the inner core of the will. And this seems to be, for instance, the approach of Kant, even Adam Smith, is just forget about all of the, the contingencies and just assess the will. Uh, that has, in my own view, has its own major problems, which is how does one really assess intention uh, without also uh, including contingency within that? Um, so I don't think that follows, frankly. That's why I think this essay is actually quite good. Um, but even this will, but even this will not make moral judgments immune to luck. So even Kant's sort of view here, there seems to be sort of a luck that's still part of it. And for instance, notice that he Kant argues that virtue should, should be possible for everyone. Well, it looks like there are factors that are actually beyond the agent's control that can still interfere with our decisions to act. In other words, it seems like for some people, certain virtues may not actually be in their capacities to do so. Um, it's outside of their control. Think about the person who has a clinical, a medical condition in which they're always lying right? They're lying about everything nonstop, right? At some point, we would begin to recognize that their lying is something that's actually outside of their control. And so in that case, it looks like even these sorts of judgments about the will, they don't seem to follow through. So the Kantian Adam Smith thing isn't working out. What we need here is a better assessment of the problem ultimately. And I think what ultimately Nagel's view here is that we have to come to understand the very structure of the problem in order to make sense of it. Because it looks like there's this moral paradox. Now, this is a contradiction, not a paradox, but at the core of it seems to be this idea that, quote, a person can be morally responsible only for what he does, but what he does results from a great deal that he does not do. Therefore, he is not morally responsible for what he is and, and is not responsible for those things. So, by the way, I apologize, there's spelling errors here. I actually go through and try to, to, to correct these spelling errors, but it's very difficult because of the color scheme. Anyway, my apologies there. Um, so, notice here there's this sort of contradiction at the core of it, right? You, a person's morally responsible for what he does, but what he does is not, isn't dependent upon, is dependent upon what he doesn't do. So, therefore, what he's not morally responsible for, uh, what he is, Therefore, he's not morally responsible for what he is, and he's not responsible for what he does. What? This seems to be, as it were, what we might call just the paradox of responsibility and control. And we've been describing it all along. And it's this notion 
that it, it looks like that it always depends upon this notion of genuine agency. And then what it does is it shrinks, the, our notion of agency shrinks in the face of the problem. Now, agency is this implicit sense we have that we are in control. And I think this is backed up by our experience of the world. I'm in my life and I want to drink a glass of water. And it looks like I genuinely, that experience seems to be evidence that I have agency. And of course, philosophically, uh, thinkers like Kant spend a lot of time trying to make arguments regarding the very notion of genuine agency. But you can see here is that it seems to just sort of boil down to nothing in the face of this problem of moral luck. Is there a sort of solution? Well, it looks like at the core of it is it's really this problem regarding the freedom of the will and the, this notion of the determinism of our circumstances. So it's this basic free will debate, right? So this is where this, this essay is only found. Are we really free or are we determined? That is, are my, are my actions determined as a consequence of the universe or the consequence of my living in the United States and or the consequence of my being white or so on and so forth? Or am I, are my choices determined by this agency that I apparently seem to have an experience of but doesn't seem to hold up in the face of my scientific evidence for cause and effect, the cause and effect continuum of nature, right? So what are the different ways of this approach? And this isn't meant to be a sort of summary of the free will debate, but we can say on the one hand, you have the determinist perspective, the what we might call the incompatibilist approach, which is namely to say that, no, it's you're totally determined. Um, yeah, there, you could also have the person who, like Sartre, for instance, who just denies determinism. And so you have the sort of um, another version of incompatibilism. The compatibilist approach says, well, in some ways uh, we're free and in some ways we're not free but or we're determined, but that ultimately the, the, there is a theoretical model which can show that those two things are compatible. That is, it's compatible for us to be free, to our actions to be freely determined by our will. But on the other hand, it's compatible with the idea that some actions are not in our control. Um, so will a compatibilist approach work for this problem? Um, and this is sort of the question that Nagel takes us. He says, but there is a problem here, which is namely that this solution does not help us in terms of how skeptical problems arise exactly, right? Uh, like, why do these skeptical problems arise? Remember, this is the epistemological wing of the problem here. Uh, so, and it doesn't look, so the compatibilist can sort of say, oh, okay, there's a metaphysical or there's an ontological account that can make sense of freedom and determinism and its compatibility. But if this really is compatible, then why is it that we sort of, this, this problem raises a question, the moral luck problem raises a question regarding how we can know what's happening and make moral judgments and know that those moral judgments are sufficient. And it doesn't look like the compatibilist problem can make sense of this side of the problem. So here's another problem, right? Quote, the self which acts and is the object of moral judgment is threatened with the dis disillusion by the absorption of its acts and impulses into the class of events. So moral judgments of a person is a judgment not of what happens to him, but of him, right? So you can see here is that this, we start to see that the problem really seems to have to do with the notion of agency and the way that agency is, is absorbed or dissolved by um, this class or category of actions uh, which can't be accounted for, which are outside of our control. So in a sense, the problem actually has no solution. So on the one hand, and I kind of like this ending of the essay quite a bit, is that there is no way to really resolve this problem, the skeptical problem. It will continue even in a, even in a compatibilist solution. And it looks like the compatibilist solution like looks like the best sort of solution but in a certain way, it still can't ever really get out of it. Um, so what you can see here is that it doesn't look like the, the compatible solution cannot give an account of the act of self. And that's really the problem is we need an account of what it means to be a genuine agent that's involved in acting. That's an account of what the will ultimately needs to point us towards. A couple points here. There's a close connection between our feelings about ourselves and our feelings of others, for instance. Um, and, um, and there's a close connection about how we judge others based upon how we judge ourselves. So it's unlikely, for instance, that if I steal from my, if I steal from my employer every week, 
then I'm likely to judge another person who does that in the same way as if I didn't, right? So there is a close connection between our internal moral sense and the external moral judgments we have of others. Guilt and shame are moral attitudes here, right? When people don't have guilt and they don't feel shame, right, that tells us something about them, right? Um, it tells us about their agency, right? But you can see here, we cannot take an external perspective of ourselves, right? So we can never recognize ourselves from this external perspective. Um, and we also can never recognize the other person from the internal sense, right? So making a moral judgment is really a form of extension from our internal sense of self towards these others. And the external view forces itself on us at the same time, and we can't really resist it. That is... It looks like the source of the puzzle, the source of the paradox, is in the paradox of the fact that we make judgments of the world, but since we are the ones making the judgments, then there's always this sense in which we are we're divided qualitatively, categorically, um, from, the, from those things, right? So there's a division between the internal and the external, right? Or someone might say a division between the subject and the object. But that's not what he says. So I would lodge that critique at him here. Um, the problem of moral luck requires an account of internal agency at the end of the day. Um, but it's not enough to say merely that our basic moral attitudes towards ourselves and others are determined by what is actual. For they are also threatened by the sources of that actuality and by the external view um, of action which forces itself on us when we see how everything we do belongs to a world that we've not created ourselves. So the question here is, uh, by the way, that is the concluding segment of his essay. So you can see here is that we have to live with this paradox. And so here, what I would ask you is, what in your life do you think reveals this problem of moral luck? And to what degree, for instance, in your average everyday life, do you, are you troubled by this? Um, Right? What's outside of your control that you feel morally responsible for? Um, and on the one hand, figure out a case in your life that's like that, and you'll suddenly recognize the, the I think, the angst and dimension and the, and the, um, existential, the existential angst that's related to this problem, which is it looks like there's a lot of things. So, for instance, imagine if my child, my son, develops a you know, horrible neurological condition. Uh, that ruins the rest of his life, and it's somehow genetically related to me, right? Um, if that happened, right, I would feel completely responsible for something that I wasn't responsible for, right? And notice how these sorts of paradoxes really seem to go to the basis of a lot of, I think, the anxiety and despair we're likely to have in our everyday lives when it's related to moral action, okay? That's a hopefully a good summary of moral luck for you. Um, and I hope it's, it's interesting and provocative. I certainly think it is. Thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you guys online.